Well, welcome to the last in our series of lectures on Paul. Now, since this is the final week of the course, I know that you are all very busy working on your exegetical papers. And so I'm going to keep the lecture very short this week. Before we end the course, I just wanted to say a word or two on the issue of pseudonymity. Now, I think that our textbook is excellent overall, um, but as I mentioned to some of you in the discussion forum, I think that the treatment of pseudonymity in our textbook uh, is a bit misleading. So that's why uh, I didn't want to end the course without just saying a word or two about this issue. Now, um, in our textbook, uh, the authors cite this passage from a commentary on the pastoral epistles by I. Howard Marshall. Marshall writes this, Since the nuance of deceit seems to be inseparable from the use of the terms pseudonymity and pseudepigraphy and gives them a pejorative sense, we need another term that will refer more positively to the activity of writing in another person's name without intent to deceive. Perhaps alonymity and alipigraphy may be suggested as suitable alternatives. Now, the authors of our textbook seem to understand Marshall to be saying that pseudonymity equals alonymity. So they present Marshall as if he is saying that we should simply take the word pseudonymity and replace it um, with alonymity, which has less negative connotations. And so uh, they take this word alonymity, which Marshall has coined, and they apply it to the debate over authorship um, in all of the disputed epistles. So recall that there are six disputed Pauline epistles, 2 Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, and the Pastorals, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And they actually quote uh, Marshall in their discussion of the authorship of 2 Thessalonians. And so they, while our, the authors of our textbook ultimately conclude that Paul did, did indeed write 2 Thessalonians, that 2 Thessalonians is authentically Pauline, they suggest here by quoting Marshall that if Paul didn't write uh, 2 Thessalonians, then it, we should think of this as alonymity, um, and, and it's not really a, a theological problem for us. Well, I think that this is a serious misunderstanding of Marshall's argument. Uh, Marshall is not suggesting that we simply replace the word pseudonymity with alonymity. If you read uh, this quote from Marshall in context, it's clear that Marshall's doing something quite different. Marshall is observing that the term pseudonymity, as it is traditionally used, covers a wide spectrum of scenarios. All right, so on one end of the spectrum is forgery. Okay, so this would be the idea that the letter is produced for the purpose of deceiving the audience into believing that it came from, from Paul. But on the other end of the spectrum, you could have the scenario where Paul asks a close associate to compose the letter for him and perhaps even checks it over, reads it uh, before the letter is sent off. Okay, now these are two enormously different uh, scenarios where uh, you know, on one end of the spectrum, Paul has absolutely no say in the letter. It's, it's written by someone else after he's dead. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the letter is written with Paul's authority and full knowledge. Well, pseudonymity covers both of these scenarios because in both scenarios, the text was written by someone other than the named author. And so Marshall is simply suggesting that we need uh, words to distinguish between uh, different types of uh, this what has typically been called pseudonymity. So in addition to uh, the idea that on the far end of the spectrum here that uh, Paul asked an associate to compose a letter for him, Marshall lists two other scenarios. One scenario would be that after Paul's death, a close associate edits and expands one of his letters. And another uh, uh, scenario that Marshall envisions is that after Paul's death, a close associate wrote the letter as he thought Paul would have written. Now, again, as I said, this quotation from Marshall comes from his commentary on the pastoral letters. And Marshall argues that these scenarios here, the second and third scenario here, are the best um, explanation for the pastoral epistles. He argues that, that they were written um, by Paul's associates, perhaps including Timothy and Titus, who had genuine remembrances and maybe even notes and letters from Paul, and they were taking authentic Pauline material that, that he had communicated to them, 
um, and they are putting it in a, a, a different form uh, and, and writing the, uh, these letters that express genuine, authentic information that they have from Paul. And Marshall's point is simply that this is, you know, we, we, need to, uh, we need a word that distinguishes this type of scenario from the uh, scenario of something being forged, something being written by um, another uh, person who uh, is not passing on genuine traditions from Paul. Um, and I think that this is a very good point. Uh, I think that we do need another word like that. Um, and I think that his scenarios here are very plausible. If you think about it, I mean, we know for a fact that Paul had these associates like Timothy and Titus. Uh, it's, it's unimaginable that Paul didn't, throughout his time working with these associates, communicate information to them and, and teach them and instruct them. And after Paul's death, it's, it seems natural to think that um, these people who work so closely with Paul might have an occasion to want to, to preserve uh, these memories and traditions that they have from Paul uh, in, in the form of a letter, like what we find in, in 1 Timothy. So um, I, I, I agree with Marshall. I think he, he makes a good case in that I think the term he coins here is useful. Um, but again, the way it's then taken by uh, the authors of our textbook and applied to all these other letters is, I, I think, a mistake. So specifically, 2 Thessalonians. Um, the authors, as I mentioned before, they quote this passage from Marshall in their discussion of the authorship of 2 Thessalonians. And they suggest that what, while scholars have typically referred to um, the theory that someone else wrote this letter in Paul's name uh, as pseudonymity, that we should instead use this word allonymity, which has uh, less negative connotations. Well, uh, that is absolutely not what Marshall thought about the authorship of 2 Thessalonians. He thought 2 Thessalonians, if it was not written by Paul, would be a clear example of pseudonymity, precisely the um, activity that he coined this word to, to distinguish his, his view from. Uh, so uh, Marshall thought that, that Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians. He did not think that 2 Thessalonians was written by someone else. But if it had been written by someone else, it would have been what Marshall describes as pseudonymity, for sure. Um, it, because remember what is said in 2 Thessalonians. There's this, there's this line in chapter 3, verse 17, where uh, the author says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the mark in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. So if that wasn't written by Paul, then I, I see no other way to understand this than a, a very flagrant uh, and deceptive uh, act by the author. And Marshall certainly agrees with that. He, this is what he writes about this view that 2 Thessalonians was not written by Paul. He says, this theory attributes to the author a degree of literary depravity, which is scarcely conceivable. One may surely take it as a working rule that a Christian author is honest unless there is no other solution to a problem than his deceitfulness. So Marshall recognizes what I think is obvious is that if 2 Thessalonians was not written by Paul, then you simply can't get away from the conclusion that it was written with the intent to deceive. Um, the idea that saying something like this was just a, uh, a literary convention that the, the, the audience would have recognized that, that this wasn't actually coming from Paul, I, I think that's preposterous. I think clearly if Paul did not write 2 Thessalonians, then we have a problem. We have a, a case of uh, deception um, in, in the scriptures, which I think we would have to be honest and would have to say that that's a real, uh, real problem. That would require us to either remove 2 Thessalonians from the canon or uh, ra rather radically um, rethink how, how we think about Scripture. Specifically, if you hold to the doctrine of inerrancy, that Scripture is without error, um, then I just don't see how you could, you could square that with the idea that 2 Thessalonians was not written by Paul. So again, Marshall would never use the word alanimity to describe uh, a 
pseudonymous uh, authorship of 2 Thessalonians. On the contrary, he coined the term alonymity precisely for the purpose of distinguishing what he was suggesting for the pastoral epistles from this type of uh, activity that's being suggested for 2 Thessalonians. All right, well, that wraps up our lectures on Paul. Uh, it's been a tremendous privilege to, to teach this course and to, to go on this journey with you through the Pauline letters. And um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, if In this final week, as you're working on those papers, please feel free, free, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. As I said before, if you're you know, if you need a source at the last minute that's at the library that you can't access, um, I'd be happy to, to go and, and scan a chapter or an article for you, so just let me know. Um, do follow the uh, instructions and, and the style guides that I've, I've sent you. Um, follow those closely. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. All right, well, it's been a tremendous uh, joy and privilege to, to teach this course. I hope you uh, enjoy this final week and have a lot of fun writing those papers.